Tonight we're going to start a series on walking in divine health. And as we go through this series, we're going to be discussing numerous topics over the next five weeks. So tonight, how many weird people we got in, the class, in, in here tonight? Any weird people? Oh, we got, well, praise God. I, I wasn't expecting to see near that many hands. But um, when you think about being weird, the Bible says that God describes us as a peculiar people, which means weird, unique, kind of odd, strange, different. And when I think about what is it about believers that makes us different, is it the clothes we wear or things like that? Obviously not. We, we dress similar to the society that we live in. Is it our hairstyles? No, obviously not. We have the same hairstyles with everybody else in the society we live in. It's not skin color because once we get saved, we don't turn green or blue and become a Martian or a Smurf. So what is it about Christians that should make us different, that should set us apart, that should make us strange or unique? Well, Romans 12, 2 says, Be not conformed to the image of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that word conformed means that you pick out something as a standard and you bring yourself under that standard. You submit to the standard of what you've said, okay, this is my standard. So the Bible's saying, don't set the world as your standard. But be changed, be made strange, be made weird, be made unique by the changing of your mind. In other words, the thing that makes Christ, the thing that should make Christians so peculiar is the way we think. But what I've found when we talk to people in the, in the body of Christ, you can talk to a Christian and say, what's your views on how to get a raise? What's your views on promotions? And there's really not much different than somebody outside in the world. And so when we start talking about sickness and disease, you sit down with a believer and you say, what's your views concerning sickness and disease? And there's really not much difference between a believer and an unbeliever in the way we think. And there's a problem with that because the Bible says we should be so totally uniquely different from the way the world thinks that we should be strange. When we start talking to an unbeliever about sickness and disease, they should look at us and go, where do you get that? That's weird. That's odd. And the world has four seasons, and we do too. But our four seasons should be spring, summer, fall, and winter. But the world says the seasons are cold season, flu season, allergy season, and sinus season. And many people in the church believe that. But we should be at a place where the temperature change shouldn't affect us. And so when we look at Romans 12 too, there should be a unique difference that makes us very peculiar in the way we think. And so tonight, since we're talking about sickness and disease, the way we think about sickness and disease should be so totally unique, so totally different from the world that we stand out like a sore thumb. I want to start out by giving you three verses, and I'm going to do each one of these verses individually. But then at the end of the three, I'm going to marry them together. And I've, I've got my verses written out, so I'm not going to be turning in my Bible. So Hosea 4, 6. I'll give you all just a little second time to get there, but I may be going a little quick. Because, like I say, I've got them written out. Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. In Hosea 4, 6, it says, My people. Now, obviously, this is an Old Testament book. So the people of God in the Old Testament were the children of Israel. And he's telling them, look, you as my children have forgotten me. You've, you've neglected to, to study my law. You've, for, you've neglected to have knowledge and understanding concerning my word. And because you've rejected that knowledge, you're being destroyed. And so when it looks at my people, it says, we're the people of God, are being destroyed because we have a lack of knowledge. 
Now let's, tie, let's look at the second verse. John chapter 10, verse 10. John 10, 10 says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that life have it more abundantly. So here we see two different sides of the coin. We see the thief has one intent, to steal, to kill, to destroy, to do everything he can to break you down. And we see God, the, the, the Christ side of the coin, is to give life and that life more abundantly. So we've got two sides. We've got Christ and we've got Antichrist. Christ is life, abundant life, abund more abundant life. Antichrist, steal, kill, destroy. The third verse we're going to look at is Matthew 11 and 12. Matthew 11 12 says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. So when we look at that verse, obviously it says from the days of John the Baptist. Well, we know that when John the Baptist came on the scene, he began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So that meant that at that time, there was something changed. The kingdom of heaven was within reach. It was within grasp at that time. Because he began to preach, it's at hand. And said, repent, so we can enter the kingdom of heaven. It says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. So who are the, what is the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven are the believers that accepted Jesus Christ. They enter into the kingdom of heaven. And it says they suffer violence. In other words, Satan has got some way that he's bringing violence against the kingdom of heaven. He's, he's doing it. He's got a desire to just beat the kingdom up. Just beat on it, beat on it, beat on it. And it says, but the, the violent take it by force. And we'll talk about that later. Now let me marry these three verses together. My children, the citizens of the kingdom of heaven, are suffering violence at the hands of the thief who is stealing from them, killing them, and destroying because they don't have the knowledge and understanding of the word. Y'all agree with that? I married those three verses together. And it shows us that many times we go through sickness, we go through disease, we go through broken relationships, we go through financial difficulties, we go through all these things because we're suffering violence at the hand of the thief because we don't understand it. We don't understand Scripture. And so when we look at this, we should understand there's two sides to the coin. There's the Christ side and there's the Antichrist side. Christ side, again, is life, abundant life, and more abundant life. The Antichrist side is violence, suffering violence, stealing, killing, destroying. So we've got the two separate sides. So if we look at it from that perspective, that takes out the change in temperature. That takes out something being contagious. That takes out it's an infectious disease. That takes those principles out. It's one or the other. And when we begin to change our perspective and look at it from that perspective, that's what makes us so different. That's what makes us weird. Because when somebody says, oh, it's flu season, no. The cold weather doesn't have anything to do with that. I mean, we think about the cold weather. The cold weather kills a lot of things. So if, logically, the cold weather should kill something like the flu. I mean, just thinking about it logically. So we've got to understand that the two sides of the coin, it's either Christ and his, his plan, or it's Antichrist. Well, the Bible says that, that Satan is a thief, and he's a liar. And those two fall hand in hand. How many of you know a thief that comes out and says, I stole it? Nobody. I mean, very few thieves want to tell you they did it. I mean... Barry, you mind if I use you as an example? Barry, Barry has a party, and he invites all of us to his house, and we do this every week. We get together, we go to Barry's house, 
and I'm the thief. And I go in, and, man, he's got a collection of baseball cards. And I find, man, he's got a Stan Musial card. And I take it. A bear comes to me and says, man, we had a party the other day, and somebody took my Stan Musial card. Well, it was probably Lamar. I mean, what I did, I just, con- I just convinced him that it wasn't me. So now, the next week, we get together for the party, and I'm like, remember, you better keep your eye on Lamar. So Barry's sitting there going, I'm going to hang around with Lamar. So he's hanging around with Lamar the whole party. He goes back into his room with all his baseball cards, and God, like somebody done took his Thurman Munson card. And he's like... He comes to me and says, Ron, I don't understand it. Lamar, I was, I was kind of looking, over, looking at Lamar all the time last week, and I still got to miss the card. Well, you mean it wasn't Lamar? It had to be Michael. <laughs> and so next time, he, he's shadowing Michael. He's walking around looking at Michael, making sure Michael doesn't get in there. Well, I've got him focused on something else. I go in there and I take three or four of his cards. And, I mean, these cards are worth some money. And he comes to me the next week, man, it wasn't Michael either. Man, I don't know who it might be. You, Mark, probably. And so the thief is getting him focused on everything else. So the, as Satan is a thief, he's convincing us that we need to pay attention to the weather. He's convincing us we need to pay attention to something else besides Him. Because if we don't recognize that getting the sickness and disease is an attack by the devil, and we're focused on everything else, we don't recognize the schemes of the devil. So He can come in here, boom, I'm going to throw a fiery dart at Barry. And He's not even going to recognize it. He's got His focus on Mark and Michael and Lamar and two or three other people. Because he's coming to the thief, asking him why or who's doing it. And I've convinced him, you know, it's not me. I wouldn't do that. But he knows I've got a collection of cards at my house, and I know what they're worth. Oh, he wouldn't steal them. He knows what they're worth. He's got a good collection too. So we need to recognize the schemes of the devil. We need to recognize a thief is going to steal from us he's going to destroy us he's going to do everything he can to steal kill and destroy and then lie to us about that it's not him so we number one we need to change our thinking so we recognize the devil and when when we start thinking about how satan can steal in the parable of the sower in mark chapter 4 verse 15 it says satan cometh immediately to steal the word to sown in your heart See, if he can come and he can steal the word out of your heart, he can put whatever scheme, whatever thought, whatever trap in your mind he wants to. And he can convince you because the word's already been taken out. He can convince you it's anything or everything else. And so you're sitting there going, I don't understand why I'm going through this sickness. I don't understand. I hadn't been around anybody with the flu. I don't know how I got the flu. I mean, I washed my hands with hand sanitizer. I, I sprayed Lysol throughout the house every day. How did I get the flu? Because he's convinced you that it's not him. It's something else. So we're looking at something else. So Satan, like all thieves, is a blame shifter. He wants to shift the blame to get the attention off of him. So we don't recognize it. We don't understand that he's the one doing it. He's the one that's stealing. He's the one that's killing. He's the one that's destroying. And we're looking at everything else going, what's causing it? So we've got to change the way we think. So our thoughts should be so totally different from the world when the world says, oh, man, it's flu season. Okay, well, you better go get your flu shot. You better stock up on Lysol. The church should say, I'm not going to deal with it. I'm not going to have that in my house. If it comes in my house, I'm going to do my warfare. Because the Bible says that the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, but the violent take it by force. So we've got to understand that it's him. 
So I'm going to start just going through some scriptures, dealing with knowledge, dealing with thoughts, and different things. So get your pencil ready and get ready. 2 Peter 1 verse 3. 2 Peter 1, 3 says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life, all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So see, there we go. It says he's given us everything that pertains to life. Well, life doesn't include doesn't mean sickness life doesn't mean disease life doesn't mean all this being stolen from being killed being destroyed life is what jesus said i've come to give you abundant life and it says he's given us everything we need that pertains to it and but it says through the knowledge of him so remember hosea 4 6 says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge so there's the correlation. If we want to have life and we want to have abundant life, we have to begin to get the knowledge of what he's done, how he's done it, and what he's actually provided for us. Third John 2. Third John verse 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things, remember, all things, he wishes above all things, that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. So here he's talking about being in prosperity and being in health. He didn't say, I wish above all things that you'd be sick or that you'd get sick yearly or you'd go through some kind of ter- terrible disease or something. He said, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health. But it says, even as your soul prospers. Now, when we look at that, we have to understand soul prosperity. What is soul prosperity? A soul is basically the mind, the will, and the emotions. So in order for soul, the soul to prosper, the mind has to change. It has to get in line with the Word of God. So when the mind changes and gets in line with the Word of God, that's the first step. The mind begins to change. We're lined up with the Word. Now our mind has got us in position for soul prosperity. Secondly, it says the will. We have to set our will and say, okay, I'm going to do what the Word says. I may not see the results of it right off the bat, but I'm going to set my will that I'm going to continue to do what the Word says until I begin to see the results. See, if we set our will and say, you know, I'm going to do it for three weeks, and if I don't see any results, I'm going to go back doing what I was doing. Our will's not set. Our will needs to be set in stone. It needs to be set in concrete. Stamp it in there and say, this is what the Word says. This is what I'm going to do. So the first thing that takes place is our mind begins to change. Then secondly, we set our will. And then the third thing, our emotions have to become stable. And you say, what does that mean? I ask this question to people every once in a while. What would happen if somebody were to spit on you? And I get different answers. A lot of times I get, well, I'd get mad. I'd get angry. I'd get even. But you want to know what the truth of the matter is if somebody spits on you? The only thing you get is wit. That's the truth. Everything else is an emotional response. And your emotions, if somebody walks up and spits on you, yeah, it's going to be nasty. It's they spit on Jesus. He didn't retaliate. Now, am I at that place yet? I don't know. Hadn't had anybody spit on me. <laughs> Praise God. We, we don't want to try it. But your emotions, see, when, when you're an emotional person and you base things on an emotional decision, somebody can say something to you, boom, you flip. You change just because somebody said something, somebody did something. And now, because your emotions were on this path, boom, you jumped over here, and you're on a whole different path. If you were a train, they'd say you got derailed. So soul prosperity means that your mind changes to line up with the Word. Your will 
become set in stone, that you're going to follow the path what the Word says, and your emotions quit going from here to here to here, they come in line. And so soul prosperity means those three things begin to line up, and now you're in position for those things to happen, to walk in prosperity and to walk in health. But until we get those three things in line, we're going to be all over the place. We might be in health today, tomorrow we're going to be sick. We might be happy today, tomorrow we're angry. We've got to get all three things in line. Soul prosperity. So from that verse, from 3 John 2, we can see that God's will for us is that we be in health. And we get there through lining those three things up and through the knowledge of the Word of God, then we begin to recognize the enemy. When we begin to recognize the enemy, we quit blaming it on everything else. We quit accepting the lies that Satan's telling us. And we start realizing this is what the real root is. Again, every thief is a blame shifter. He can continue to steal, to kill, and destroy if you don't recognize his ways, his schemes, because you think it's someone or something else. And I keep saying that because that's the key. We need to recognize the ways and the schemes of the devil. Romans 8, 2. It says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. When we were born, we were born under the law of sin and death. When we got saved, we shifted jurisdictions. We are now able to walk under the law of sin, not under the law of sin and death, but the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Salvation brought us into that law. But if our mind doesn't change, we still think we're walking under the law of sin and death. And as long as we're walking under the law of sin and death... We're going to get sin and death for results. I mean, your mindset, it's, it's got a lot to do with the mindset. Romans 8, 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. There again, it's talking about the law of sin and death. When we're, when we're fleshly minded, when we're carnal minded, and we're thinking the same way the world is thinking, we're going to get the same results as the world. Because it says, they that are after the flesh think about things just like the flesh. In other words, an unsaved man looks at thing from everything from a fleshly perspective, from a natural perspective, from the perspective that it's got to do to what, with the weather. It's got to do with this. Because an unsaved man is not going to admit it's the devil. An unsaved man is not going to say, well, Satan's the reason this is coming on me. He's, he's going to sit there and say, no, it's got to be the weather. It's got to be, it's got to be this, or it's got to be that, or it's got to be, I forgot to put on a stocking cap when I went outside. It's raining and it's cold. My head got wet. It says, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. That's continuate, continuation of Romans 8, 5. It says, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So when we begin to get our focus on what the Word says, We'll set our mind on the things of God. We'll set our mind on recognizing it from the perspective that the way Jesus looked at it. Jesus didn't walk into a place and say, oh, there's example, perfect example. Jesus walked into Peter's house, and Peter's mother-in-law was laying there sick with a fever. Jesus didn't go, now, Miss, Miss Peter, are you... You wrapped up in enough blankets? You got a hot water bottle? Did you take your two Tylenol? You know, you got a sweat of fever out. No, Jesus didn't do that. He walked in there and he said, I rebuke this fever and I command it to leave. And the Bible says she got up immediately and began to serve. If Jesus recognized it was a spiritual thing, he, he dealt with it from a spirit. If it would have been a natural thing, I can picture that it, he would have dealt with it from a natural perspective. But he understood sickness in that aspect was a spiritual thing. His mind was on the spirit. He looked at it from a spiritual perspective. And everything he dealt with was from a spiritual perspective. Romans 8, 6. For to be carnally minded is death. 
In other words, if we think about things the same way an unsaved man does, we're going to get death as a result. We've got to change our mind and get into a spiritual perspective and understand things from a spiritual perspective. If we look at, it, if we look at everything we do, if we look at our job and say, well, this is the job I've got, this is the money I make, there's no way I'm going to get it raised, guess what? We're looking at it from a natural perspective. We don't understand the law of tithing, the law of giving. We've got to understand those things from a spiritual perspective. The Bible says promotion doesn't come from the east or the west. Promotion comes from the Lord. So if we're looking at it, well, I've got to get this education, and I've got to... Now, I'm not putting down college education at all. But we need to understand things from a biblical perspective. We've got to get to that place. So, Romans 8, 6 again. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So there it is again. When I get my mind set on spiritual things, I, I begin to, number one, I get life the health aspect has to come about because I've got my soul in line my soul my mind is focused on spiritual things and because it's focused on focused on spiritual things I'm beginning to get life and not only am I beginning to get life but because my emotions have become stable I'm getting peace people all the time oh I just I don't have no peace just oh I got I'm just I'm just worried about this or I'm worried about that or I I got a bill I got my kids are doing it my just no peace so when we get our focus off of the natural and get it on spiritual then we begin to get the life and we begin to get the peace Romans eight seven says, because the carnal mind, in other words, the naturally thinking mind, is enmity against God. When we think about things from a natural perspective, guess what? That puts us on the side against God. Enmity means we're an enemy of God. When we think about things from a natural perspective, and we look at everything we're going through from a natural perspective, we actually get on the opposite side of God and begin to fight against Him. How can we get life when we're fighting against God? We can't. We've got to get to that place where we understand, i got to change. If I want God's blessing, if I want God's health, if I want God's life poured into me, I've got to get on the same side with Him. I can't fight against Him. How can two walk together unless they agree? We've got to get in line. We've got to walk with God. We can't walk against him and expect him to bless us, expect him to give us life. We've got to get on the same side. It says, goes on, it says, For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now the law of God that we're talking about is the law of the life of Christ Jesus. So it's not subject to the law of the life in Christ Jesus, and it can't be. So a carnal mind is going to be subject to the law of sin and death. And it's going to reap sin and death. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, we're subject to that. We're sitting there saying, okay, God, I understand your law. Your law is you sent your son. His, his, one of his purposes was to give me abundant life. I recognize that when I'm not going through abundant life, there's something attacking my body. It's got to be the enemy. We get under a different law. Philippians 2.5. Now, these next couple of verses, I think we're going to have just enough time to get finished with them. Next couple of verses, I think I'm going to blow your mind a little bit. Philippians 2.5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And you say, we can have the mind of Christ? Well, the Bible says, let the mind be in you that was also in Christ. So if, if, if Jesus walks up and says, boom, here's my mind, boom, here's, Bear, here's my mind. you got my mind now. Well, how can I have the mind of Christ? 
I can't think about things from a carnal perspective. I have to think about them as if Jesus was thinking about it. So let me look at some verses here. Now these I don't have written down, so I'm in my Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and there's quite a few verses I'm going to read through here. It's verses 9 through 16. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 16. It says, <clears throat> verse 9 says, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So here's one of the things people say. I don't know what God's prepared. I don't know the thing. And they're right. Because the Bible says, I hadn't seen it, ear hadn't heard it, neither had, has it entered into the mind, the things that God has prepared. So we're sitting there saying, well, how am I supposed to have the mind of Christ if I hadn't seen it, if I hadn't heard it? I don't know it. Well, let's keep reading. Verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. He hath revealed what? The things that He's prepared for us. The things that He wants us to know. And He's done it by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. The Holy Spirit is searching out the deep things of God. The Holy Spirit is seeking out the things of God, looking to find out what the mind of God is, looking to see what the thoughts of God are. And He's, he's seeking those things. He's searching those things. It says, for what, verse 11 says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of the man which is in him? In other words, the only way to know the, the deep things of a person is to go know him from the spirit. And the Bible tells us to know no man except by the Spirit. So if we want to know really who somebody is, we are not going to know him by the Spirit. If we really want to know who God is, we have to know him by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to reveal him to us. It says, Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. So here it tells us that as a, as a natural man, we can't know the things of God. But the Spirit of God knows them. Verse 12 says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So here it's telling us, we don't have the Spirit of the world. When we accepted Christ, we received the Spirit. Now I'm not saying we received the baptism of the Spirit, I believe there's two different things. But the Bible says when we, re, we get saved, we receive the Holy Spirit. So we don't, we don't have the Spirit of the world anymore. That's why we're called a new creation. We've received the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says we've received the Spirit which is of God, which is the Holy Spirit, that we might know the things which are freely given to us of God. See, the Holy Spirit's here so that we'll know the things which are of God. Verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So there again, we're, we've got to understand, if we look at things from a natural perspective, we're only going to get natural results. We've got to understand, we've got to get in the spirit realm and look at things from a spiritual perspective, from the, from the mind of the Holy Spirit. Verse 14, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. So when we're looking at things from a carnal perspective, when we're looking at things the same way the world does, we can't receive the things of God because they're foolishness. We, we can't understand some of the stuff of God if we're constantly looking at it from a natural perspective, the same way that an unsaved man looks at it. We've got to change our mindset. In verse 15, but he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Let's go on to verse 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? Who's known the mind of the Lord? None of us. But it goes on, it says, but we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. I'll say that one more time. We have the mind of Christ. So when we have the mind of Christ, 
Because we have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit knows the things of God, the Holy Spirit's in us, we have the mind of Christ, which we can seek the Holy Spirit to give us the mind of God, so we can see things from the perspective that God sees them. So when we, when we begin to look at things from that perspective, it, it changes things. If we look at things the way Jesus looked at them, if we look at them with the mind of Christ, through the eyes of the Holy Spirit, it totally changes us. And when I started off tonight saying, how many people we got in here that are weird, a lot of hands went up. But the reality of it is, most of us in here think the same way an unsaved man thinks. I got two verses I'm going to finish up with. Isaiah chapter 55, and I've got to turn to these myself. So, Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. And I, I see these verses read and quoted several, several times, but I want to look at them from a different perspective. Isaiah 55, verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I hear people say this all the time, saying, well, you know, we can't know the thoughts of God. We can't, His thoughts are so much higher than us. I look at this from a little different perspective. We just saw that we have the mind of Christ. So I look at these two verses and say, Jesus is looking at us saying, my ways are not your ways. Shame on you. You've got the mind of Christ. Shame on you. You should have the same thoughts I do. My ways are not your ways. Shame on you. You've got the Holy Spirit. Your ways should be my ways. Your thoughts should be my thoughts. We've got to change the way we think. Tonight, my goal has been to convince you that sickness is not natural. Sickness is an attack by the devil, and we need to recognize it as what it is. We need to quit looking at it that it's because of the cold weather, it's because of the hot weather, it's because of the pollen in the air, it's because Satan is a liar. And just like I told you, I'm a thief. Barry's got a collection of baseball cards. I'm going in stealing his cards, but I'm telling him it's everybody else. Satan is telling us it's the cold weather. It's the pollen in the air it's this it's that it's contagious it's whatever but it's not it's an attack we need to recognize the attacks because the bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through god for the pulling down of strongholds and it tells us we don't wrestle with flesh and blood but with principalities and powers so we need to recognize that God has given us the ability to recognize the enemy. He's given us his mind. He's given us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit knows his mind. The Holy Spirit searches out the things of God. So we've got to begin to look at things from a biblical perspective, from a mindset of this is the way God looks at it. This isn't the way that my brother looks at it. This is the way God looks at it. We've got to change the way we think. Next week, we're going to start looking at doorways. In other words, what are some things that we do or what are some things that happen that open up opportunities for sickness to attach us, to attack us? We're going to begin to look at those things.